scripture text this evening is from Joshua 23. Joshua 23 is a great chapter because it is the speech of a great head of state. Joshua has been a mighty conqueror in his life. He subdued the Canaanites in the land of, of Palestine, turned it over to the Israelites, subdivided the land, established order, and was one of the greatest head of states ever to live. He's old now, and this is one of his last public addresses. Joshua 23, verse 1. Now it came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all her enemies on every side, and Joshua was old, advanced in years, that Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. See, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribes with all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan even to the great sea toward the setting of the sun. And the Lord your God, he shall thrust them out from before you and drive them from before you, and you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left in order that you may not associate with these nations these which remain among you or mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them or bow down to them but you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day for the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you. And as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. One of your men puts to flight a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you just as he promised you. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, these which remain among you, and intermarry with them so that you associate with them and they with you, Know with certainty that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now behold, today I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you, not one of them has failed. And it shall come about that just as all the good words which the Lord your God spoke to you have come upon you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the threats until he has destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. Wouldn't you love to have a head of state that's capable of giving a speech like that? In fact, any head of state that's not capable of giving a, a speech like that is a curse to a land and is a sign of God's judgment. The only kind of head of state, the only kind of political officials that we should pray, uh, fill the offices of those elected positions are those who are capable of giving speeches like this, who believe in the word of God, who believe in the supremacy of God over all, their, all of life, and who see it as their responsibility to obey and enforce the word of God. Have you ever thought about how many books of the Bible were written by politicians? Now, you talk to the average fundamentalist today, and they'll say, well, I don't like politics. Politics is dirty. I just want the Bible, okay? Just think now how much of the Bible was written by politicians, particularly heads of state. First of all, you got the first six books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were written by the head of state of Israel, Moses. Then you got Joshua, written by the head of state of Israel after the conquest of Canaan. Then... You have probably Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, written by a head of state, as it were, a judge, 
Samuel. You have uh, Psalms written by a head of state, King David mostly. You have Proverbs and the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes written by a head of state. We forgot about Esther written about a queen. We left out e Nehemiah who was a governor. We left out Ezra who was a bureaucrat in the Syrian government. Daniel who was a bureaucrat in the Babylonian government. So if you don't like politics, most of the Bible you're not going to like because it's written by godly men who took their responsibility and calling seriously in political institutions. And one man of that great family is Cromwell. And so we come back tonight to Oliver Cromwell. If you haven't been coming or you've missed any of the past six or so messages on Cromwell, I hope that you'll get them. Because just like understanding the Scottish Reformation is essential to understanding us as American Presbyterians and as American Protestants and as Americans, so understanding the Puritan Revolution and most particularly what Oliver Cromwell strove for is essentially, uh, is also essential to understanding ourselves. Here's a trivia question you can ask your friends. What was the first written constitution in Great Britain? And the answer would be the instrument of government under which Cromwell reigned as Lord Protector that he and his men wrote that constitution and it's the first written constitution England ever had. And many of the basic principles of that constitution, as we saw last week, written a hundred years before ours, over a hundred years before ours, uh, many of those basic principles that were in the instrument of government of Cromwell's day showed up shaping the government, the federal government, the constitution of the United States. Well, we're well into the Protectorate. That's the name of England under the Lord Protector. Not one time in all these many years can anybody ever say that a tinge of selfishness cast a shadow over Cromwell's life. We read about politician after politician today that lines his own pockets and takes advantage of his office for his own welfare. We find none of that in Cromwell. In fact, on more than one occasion, he waived part of his salary to help people public service and to pay for government debts and to help people in need. Even though he was an extraordinarily godly man and even though his motives were pure, he still had many enemies in England. There were still the Stuart lo loyalists, the people who wanted the Stuarts back on the throne like James and Charles. And they would take advantage of all these enemies and all the dissension that took place during Cromwell's day to plan the restoration of another Stuart, Charles II, by force of arms. And so spirit conspiracies were in the air. There was one particular conspiracy against uh, Cromwell to overthrow him and replace the Stuarts, who were tyrants uh, and immoral men at that, at the helm. And that conspiracy was known as the Sealed Knot. S-E-A-L-E-D-K-N-O-T. This group of powerful men drew up the plans for an elaborate insurrection to take place all over England on February the 6th, 1655. But in God's providence, a letter from Charles Stuart II was inter intercepted. Cromwell found out beforehand what was going to happen, and the whole operation was a failure. That's known as the Wiltshire Rebellion of 1655. It failed. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. There was all kinds of attempts to change the government by force from the right and from the left. And so to guarantee the security of the English people and of the government, Cromwell divided England into 11 associations of counties and placed one of his major generals under, uh, over each one of these 11 association of, of counties. These 11 generals were Cromwell's truest, most godly friends. He picked the godliest men he know, knew, some of whom were his own relatives, all of whom were his personal friends, to be in charge of England as it was divided into these 11 associations. 
And what was the purpose of this, uh, what on the surface seemed like a military uh, martial, uh, a military government? Well, when you understand the purpose, you'll understand it doesn't, it's not what it appears. The duties of these generals was to protect England from any insurrection and revolution, to ensure national security, to prevent any kind of plotting and unrest that would lead to bloodshed. But more importantly, the purpose of these major generals and their forces was to promote, in their words, in Cromwell's words, to promote godliness and virtue in Great Britain. Now, can you imagine an army like that? Where you divide the country in 11 districts, you put a general with his his troops in each district, and the purpose of which is to preserve godliness within that district. And how would they preserve godliness? By enforcing the existing laws against immorality and blasphemy. That was what these troops were stationed in these counters for, and that's what the major generals were given the authority to do, to suppress immorality and blasphemy by enforcing the laws on the books and thereby promoting, insofar as they, it was possible, godliness and virtue among the English people. This was a dangerous time. There needed to be troops stationed around the country, not only because there were all these insurrections and potential conspiracies, but because also England was at war with Spain and France. And those were two major military powers, and they could invade at any time, and so this force had a very practical uh, use throughout Great Britain. Also during this time, Oliver Cromwell was determined to break the back of Roman Catholic Spain. Spain had, as you know, throughout those centuries been responsible for the persecution of many, many tens of thousands of Protestants all over uh, Europe. And Cromwell knew that if he broke the back of Roman Catholic Spain once for all, there would be more peace. So he not only waged war on her by land and by sea, but also he waged war on her to make way, in his words, for the bringing of the light of the gospel and the power of the reformed religion and godliness into those foreign parts. Where do you think the foreign parts were? They were the New World. They, they were North America, the Caribbean. And S Spain, with its Roman Catholicism, already dominating by superstition South America, already began to have a stranglehold on the Caribbean and North America. And had Roman Catholicism become the dominant religion in North America, North America would have looked like South America to this very day with all its poverty and superstition and petty tyrannies and civil wars. It was Oliver Cromwell that broke the back of Spanish dominance in North America. You're Protestant and not Roman Catholic because largely of Oliver Cromwell, who hoped to destroy Roman Catholic Spanish supremacy in the New World and as a side benefit to control the gold of Peru. Well, Cromwell had already dissolved several parliaments, but he was a man who believed in representative government. He was determined to call a new parliament. He also needed official approval for his war with Spain. So a new parliament was elected, and it met on September the 17th, 1656. The opening sermon was preached by the vice chancellor of Oxford University, whose name was John Owen, one of the greatest of the Puritans. His text was from Isaiah 1432. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? That the Lord has founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. But as we're going to see, it was not simply the poor of England. It was also the poor of the various Protestant peoples of the world that looked to England for protection. John Owen's sermon to Parliament was so powerful that when he finished, the Parliament stood with shouts of, Yea, verily, Amen, which those who were there said could be heard on the shores of France or in the snow-covered Alps. Then, after John Owen preached his great sermon, Cromwell preached, or delivered, according to first-hand witnesses, one of the noblest, 
most sensible, energetic, and religious speeches ever uttered by a statesman. Let me give you a taste of it, of his speech right after John Owen to his last parliament. Therefore, this is Cromwell, Therefore, I beseech you in the name of God, set your hearts to this work. And if you set your hearts to it, then you will sing Luther's psalm, Psalm 96, uh, 46. That's a rare psalm for a Christian. And if he set his heart open and can approve it to God, we shall hear him say, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. If Pope and Spaniard and devil all set themselves against us, Though they should compass us like bees, as it is in the 118th Psalm, yet in the name of the Lord we should destroy them. And as it is in this Psalm of Luther's, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the middle of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Then the psalmist repeats two or three times, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I have done all I have to say is to pray God that he may bless you with his presence, that he who has your hearts and mine will show his presence in the midst of us. Does it remind you of Joshua? 1657, we're approaching the end of Cromwell's life. That was a burdensome year for Cromwell. In the beginning of the year, one of the chief levelers, you remember what a leveler is? A leveler was a radical Democrat. He was a man who believed that all men should have the right to vote regardless of their faith, and the levelers eventually began, began to be uh, anarchists and began to stage various kinds of revolution. In the beginning of the year 1657, one of the leading levelers, after several assassination attempts on Cromwell, tried to set fire to Whitehall, the house where Cromwell lived. But he failed. The man killed himself then by taking poison. By this time, Cromwell had many enemies. And among them, first of all, and this is important to know, among them were the royalists, those who wanted the Stuarts back on the throne. Then there were the Presbyterians, who were his enemies, many of the Presbyterians, that is, because they didn't want a Lord Protector. They wanted a monarch, a legal monarch on the throne, not particularly the, necessarily the Stuarts, but a king. Then you had the Republicans, who had the same goals uh, generally that, that uh, Cromwell wanted, and that was a republic, a Christian republic, a nation governed by law, which law written in a constitution was administered by the people. But they wanted a republic now, and they wanted it by whatever means they could establish it. And so because Cromwell was a little slower than they wanted him to be, they became his enemies, which was crazy. Then you had the levelers, the social democrats, who became violent. Then you had an interesting group of men called the Fifth Monarchy Men. These men were Christians, they, they, many of them Calvinists. They took the Bible seriously. They wanted the, uh, the government of England to be ruled exclusively, totally by the law. They were radical theonomists, but they disagreed with us in a few things. One is they believed that they needed to use the fourth force of arms to bring in the millennium that we need to set up a Christian republic in England right now and we'll use the force of arms to do it. And so a lot of their ideas went even beyond the Reformation and were extreme and fanatical ideas, and they were tremendously opposed to Cromwell. Besides these, there was a host of other sects and groups, besides many of the men in Parliament who did not like Cromwell's view of religious liberty. You remember, it was a limited religious liberty. He believed that all Protestant Christians should have the liberty in England to worship God according to the Word of God. So these were tempestuous times in the latter part of Cromwell's life. Many people felt that in order to have order and security in England, the monarch had to be restored. So Parliament voted to offer Cromwell the title of king. 
Of course, those who were loyalist, loyal to the Stuarts didn't like that. And, of course, the strict Republicans didn't like it and opposed it with great vehemence, although it's hard to say you're against the office of king when the Bible itself provides for it. But in spite of the opposition by the right and the left, Parliament on March the 31st passed the resolution and the House of Commons offered Oliver Cromwell the title and office of the King of England, Scotland, and Wales. But, as you would expect, what do you think Cromwell did? He, of course, refused it because having a crown on his head was never his aim. The object of all of his purposes and endeavors was the liberty and the peace and the glory and the godliness of England, not that he be crowned king. Well, many people have reproached him and criticized him because he didn't accept the title, which he could have. It wouldn't have been sinful for him to accept the title. It was legally offered him. The title of king is a perfectly proper title. Cromwell could have accepted it if he had so chosen. Some have reproached him for not accepting it. Others would have greatly reproached him had he accepted the crown. He personally thought that a monarchy was a form of government essential to order in Great Britain. But he knew that it must be a constitutional monarchy. Not one based on blood, but one based on the Constitution. So Oliver Cromwell is the real founder of the constitutional monarchy of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries in Great Britain. No matter how much anybody may criticize Cromwell, the English crown has never been the same since Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector. Prior to that, the kings claimed absolute uh, right over the citizenry and were tyrants, ruling according to their whims and fancies. After Cromwell, England was based on a constitution, and the king's authority was based not on blood but on constitutional law. So however a person might, a modern Englishman, might not like Oliver Cromwell, what freedom there is left in England is because Cromwell gave them a constitutional monarchy and, in a very real sense, he is the father of the constitutional republic of the United States. After Cromwell refused the crown of King of England, Parliament again inaugurated him Lord Protector. And when his new Parliament that had just been elected reconvened in 1658, it consisted of two houses rather than one. Now, let me tell you the story. What did uh, normally, when you think of Parliament, you have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. You have the House of Commons as the lower house elected by the people. You have the House of Lords made up of the powerful nobles and lords of England. And much like our Congress, it's a bicameral legislature where there's a restraint upon each house. And therefore, hopefully, with such a restraint and uh, on each house, that wisdom and maturity prevails. Well, once, Parla uh, once uh, Cromwell became protector and many of his supporters, contrary to his wishes, however, got into Parliament, they did away with the House of Lords. Because the House of Lords, you remember, was once dominated by bishops, and the bishops were the ones that persecuted the reformers. And uh, they took out the bishops, they did away with the House of Lords, and by, to the, by the way, to this very day in the United States, why most Americans, even though they won't admit it, are, have a negative attitude toward a preacher running for a political office, is a hangover from the distaste for the House of Lords because of the bishops dominating politics in the 16th and 17th century in England. And uh, so they did away with the House of Lords, and Parliament was only comprised of the House of Commons. Cromwell was wiser than that. You remember he said under his instrument of government he wanted power divided between an executive with limited, well-defined powers, i.e. himself, and a legislative body with well-defined powers, and that that legislative body, the Parliament, would be separated into two houses, the House of Lords, the Upper House, the House of Commons, and that the House of Lords be made up of Puritan Lords 
not Catholic lords, not Anglican lords, but Puritan lords, godly men. And he was so dedicated to stacking, as it were, though that has more bad connotations than, uh, than I want to imply about, but that's what he did, that just like Roosevelt stacked the Supreme Court, he decided he was going to stack the House of Lords not, no longer with power-hungry men who would take advantage of the office, but with godly men. And that was one of his mistakes, because he got a lot of these godly men from the House of Commons who were his supporters in the House of Commons, some of his greatest supporters. And when he took them out of the House of Commons and put them in the House of the Lords, that diminished his own support in the House of Commons, and it eventually turned against him. So in his second parliament, they come to work, and they find now that there's two houses, like Cromwell wanted, and like he believed was essential to sound representative government. Cromwell told the House of Commons, he said, I will not try to govern unless there's two houses to keep check on each other. Well, Commons made it clear that they wanted no other house, that they wanted no restraints, even if the restraints came from a group of wise, mature, Puritan nobles. They were not prepared to share authority with another house in a bicameral legislature. So they would not cooperate with Cromwell. Instead of continuing the reform, the Christian reform started by Cromwell, that parliament once again got bogged down with all kinds of meaningless, useless, stupid trivialities. Cromwell tried again and again to direct this parliament's attention to dealing with the great questions facing the nation but to no avail. Let me read to you a piece of one of his pleading speeches to this parliament, urging them toward their duty. This was, is from Daubigny. He says, Cromwell opened this new parliament on the 20th of January, beginning with the usual form, my lords and gentlemen of the House of Commons. He returned thanks to God for his favors, at the head of which he reckoned peace and blessings of peace, namely, the possession of political and spiritual liberty. As religion was always the first of interest in his estimation, Oliver, when speaking of this power, which is the strength of nations, called to their remembrance that England had now a godly ministry, a knowledgeable ministry, such a one as without vanity be it spoken, the world has not. If God should bless you in this work and make this meeting happy on this account, the generations to come will bless you. We have two blessings, peace and the gospel. You reckon Clinton and Dole would say that? We have two blessings, peace and the gospel. Let us have one heart and soul, one mind to maintain the honest and just rights of this nation. If you run into another flood of blood and war, this nation must sink and perish utterly. I beseech you and charge you in the name of presence of God and as before him, be sensible of these things and lay them to heart. If you prefer not the keeping of peace, that we may see the fruit of righteousness in them that love peace and embrace peace, it will be said of this poor nation, Octum est de Anglia. It's all over with England. While I live and am able, I shall be ready to stand and fall with you. I have taken my oath to govern according to the laws. And no, I sought not this place. I speak it before God, angels, and men. I did not. You sought me for it. You brought me to it. But all of his pleadings were to no avail. And so he had to dissolve this parliament as well. Listen to what he said. My lords and gentlemen, I would have been glad to have lived under my woodside, to have kept a flock of sheep, rather than undertaken such a government as this. But undertaking it by the advice and petition of you, I did look that you who had offered it unto me should make it good. Yet instead of that, you've not only disjointed yourselves, but the whole nation which is in likelihood of running into more confusion in these 15 or 16 days that you have set than it hath been from the rising of the last session of this day. 
They are endeavoring to engage the army, which is nothing less but playing the King of Scots games, and I, Stuart, and I think myself bound before God to do what I can to prevent it. In other words, he's saying you're just falling into the trap of having the tyrannical Stuarts back on the throne. I think it is high time that an end be put to your setting, sitting. And I do dissolve this parliament and let God be judge between you and me. Those were the last words Cromwell ever uttered in public. After he dissolved this parliament, a man said, a reporter, believe me, it was such of, uh, of such necessity that if their session of Parliament had continued but two or three days longer, all had been in blood, both in city and country, upon Charles Stuart's account. So in dissolving Parliament, Cromwell saved England from a bloody, another bloody civil war. Let me read to you the assessment of the situation in England at this time. Thus, whatever problems the protectorates had to confront at home, however the cavaliers, that's the royal supporters of the Stuarts, however the cavaliers might scheme and conspire, the Republicans criticize and grumble, and the level of malcontents betray their own faith by plotting with his Catholic majesty, the overwhelming fact was that Oliver Cromwell had transformed the Commonwealth of England into a great international power courted, admired, and feared throughout the world. No wonder that after King Charles II, this is a cute little story, no wonder that after King Charles II was restored, when he and his brother, instead of exacting stiff terms from King Louis XIV of France, became suppliants for the sunshine of his favors, beggars for the French favors, even the most ardent royalist supporters were heard to sigh for the great days of Oliver Cromwell. That's the king's own supporters. Before he died, Cardinal Mazarin, who was the, the uh, chief counselor of Louis XIV of France, confessed that he'd like to see the restoration of the Stuarts to the throne of England. For Cromwell's England was a hundred times more powerful than it has ever been under the old monarchy. But what about the last years? He's coming to the very end of his life. The world at large appreciates the prestige and the greatness of Cromwell's England. And its prestige brightly shined during the last months of the Lord Protector's life. In 1658, peace was concluded in the war between Sweden and Denmark, largely because of Cromwell's efforts. In May, the garrison at Jamaica, Jamaica finally drove out the Spaniards. On June the 4th, the English army won an heroic battle against the French that led to the English ownership of the city of Dunkirk. The keys of the city of Dunkirk handed over to the British commander-in-chief by King Louis XIV in person. When the treaty was signed between Oliver Cromwell and Louis XIV of France, Oliver Cromwell's name comes first and is signed Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of France and Great Britain. Louis XIV simply signs his name Louis XIV, King of the French. Shows you the power of the man. But at home in England, there was an air of gloom and confusion. The Lord Protector's health was very poor. A soldier tried to assassinate his son, Richard. According to one Venetian envoy, the people in England are nauseated with the present government, largely owing to the disillusion of the last parliament, whose members create the worst impression of the present rule among the people by the accounts that they give, so that they only desire to throw off the yoke and cast themselves on the clemency of their nat natural prince, Charles II. So as the prestige of England spread all over the world because of Cromwell, things were crumbling at home because of the ungodliness, the lack of vision and commitment, the desire for a king, even though he be a steward. In fact, there was a threat of a new civil war in the late 1650s toward the end of the protectorate. Except this civil war was being threatened now by the royalists who were amassing an army to overturn Cromwell and put the king back on the throne.
But once again, in God's providence, Cromwell found out uh, about it beforehand, and because of his elaborate precautions, the revolution never took place. He required everybody loyal to Charles Stuart to leave London immediately. He did the same thing with Bristol, Gloucester. He put several subjects under arrest. The leaders of this attempted coup were tried in a high court of justice, condemned and executed. And God preserved the protectorate. But the one thing that Cromwell should be known for, which, he's large, which largely our world is totally ignorant of, is as an international defender of the Protestant faith. Listen to Daubigny. Cromwell was not satisfied with merely frightening the Pope in his own Babylon and with directing his efforts in every quarter against the Roman power. He had at the same time zealously pursued the great cause of the Reformation in Europe and in the world and thus assigned to England the position of Queen of the Protestant world. Cromwell's vision was not simply the Protestant Reformation of England, but the Protestant Reformation of the world. Cromwell had a love for the Reformed churches all over the world as intense as his love for the Reformed churches in Great Britain. And his involvement in persecuted Protestants around the world is a moving account. First of all come the Waldensians. The Waldensians are one of the most heroic races of people that I know anything about. Back during the Middle Ages, long before the Protestant Reformation, the Waldensians, who lived in the valleys of southern central Europe, France, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, that in that part of Europe were groups of people called Waldensians who in the Middle Ages were Reformed and in the Middle Ages were Presbyterian, not recognizing the authority of the Pope, but having their church governed by elders. And in the Middle Ages, a powerful Reformed and Presbyterian influence. They were also severely persecuted in the Middle Ages as well, as you can imagine, by the Popes and by the Roman Catholic Church. Well, those times had passed. We're out of the Middle Ages. We're into the modern world. It's the late 1600s now, after all. On June the 3rd, 1655, sad news reached Cromwell from southern central Europe that filled all Protestant hearts with grief. The descendants of the Waldensians alive in the 1650s, who were the great Presbyterian evangelists of the Middle Ages, began to experience a brutal persecution against them of inconceivable violence. What caused this sudden outburst of brutal persecution against the Waldensians, who were farmers and, and in their valleys in southern central Europe, not bothering anybody, but with their Reformed churches, not their Catholic churches, the Reformed churches. 1655, why would it break out again? Think now, what do you've learned about Cromwell? What did Cromwell do in his life? Here's what happened. The Pope announced that the valleys that have belonged to the Waldensians for centuries would be given to the Irish, who were banished from Ireland because they had a part in the massacre of 100,000 Protestants on the island of Ireland. Families were ordered off their family lands. They were given 20 days down in uh, the Waldensians, 20 days to prove that they either had become Roman Catholic or that they had legally sold their property to Roman Catholics. Many hundreds of families were compelled to flee in the midst of the rigors of winter. In the spring of 1655, an army of 15,000 men entered their peaceful little reform valleys. Twenty-two villages were reduced to ashes. Aged people of both sexes were burned in their houses. Men were cut in pieces. Women were impaled naked. Children were torn from their mother's arms and their brains dashed out on the rocks. One hundred and fifty females were beheaded and their heads were used in bowling games. Because the Pope wanted to give the land to the bloodthirsty Irish. During this terrible desolation, 
The poor inhabitants of these valleys first looked to God and then looked to Cromwell. When Cromwell heard the news, he burst into tears. He was supposed to sign a treaty with France that day. But he refused to do so until the king and his chief minister, a cardinal, had bound themselves to assist him in seeing that justice was done in behalf of the Waldensians. He took 2,000 pounds from his own pocketbook and sent it to them. He had John Milton address a letter to all the Protestant states of Europe calling for their aid. He appointed a day of fasting and humiliation and then called for a general collection from all Englishmen in which collection was gathered 37,000 pounds, a very, very large amount for that day. As soon as it was found out in Europe that Cromwell had the interests of the Waldensians at heart, the persecutors began to feel the heat. They even imagined that there would be an English army that would land from English ships and overrun their country and destroy all of their persecuting armies in order to rescue the Waldensians. At one point, in fact, this was Cromwell's intention. Cromwell sought to enlist all the heads of state of Europe and their armies, if necessary, against the persecutors of the Waldensians if they did not cease and desist from their persecution. And his efforts were successful. Even the French Roman Catholic king wrote the Piedmontese that were attacking the Waldensians, urged them to restore religious liberty to the Waldensians. There was not a head of state in Europe that dared expose himself to Cromwell's displeasure by refusing Cromwell's request to come to the aids of the Waldensians. All of Europe was afraid of the new model army. At the same time, this great defender of the Protestant faith, Cromwell, wanted to give the Pope and all of his petty princes a lesson that was calculated to strike terror into their hearts. And so he sent word out to Europe that he was satisfied, having looked at the evidence, that the Pope and the petty Italian princes were responsible for this fierce persecution of the Waldensians. He wasn't going to let that out of his mind, he sent word around, and that his first opportunity he was going to send his entire English fleet into the Mediterranean to visit the lands that belonged to the Roman Catholic Church, and that he assured the Pope, by means of rumor, that the sound of his cannons would be heard in Rome itself. And he made it clear and declared publicly that he, Cromwell, would not allow the Reformed faith to be insulted in any part of the world. And as long as he was Lord Protector, the persecution diminished. The reason he was so firm was because... Now, he didn't have to send his ships to Rome. Just the rumor was enough. In his eyes, in his own eyes, and he was one of the most clear-sighted statesmen of his day, the reason he was so firm was because he, did, he saw the attack on the Waldensians not as an isolated assault upon Protestantism, but the first step of a major organized conspiracy that had as its aim the annihilation of the Reformed faith in Europe. Well, he not only came to the rescue of the Waldensians, he also came to the rescue of the French Huguenots. And remember who the French Huguenots were. They, back in the 1500s, were those great French Calvinists. Remember, Calvin was a Frenchman. Those were those great French Calvinists who clung to the truth in spite of the fact that, the, that uh, Roman Catholic France sought to squelch them out of existence and in bloody war after war sought to suppress them and on St. Bar Bartholomew Day uh, deceitfully slaughtered 35,000, 36,000 of these 
French Huguenots. They'd been persecuted for many years. They were still being persecuted by the time uh, that Cromwell set on the, uh, was the head of state of England. And these Huguenots were beginning to look to Britain for their defense and their rescue. So Cromwell sent his agents into France. And he urged the government of France to come out in favor of the oppressed Huguenots and to quit persecuting them. The French pastors, the French Reformed pastors, at the risk of their lives, would publicly pray openly for the preservation of Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell, calling him plainly, quote, their only hope next to God. His wise diplomacy prevailed. The cardinal, who was the chief advisor of Louis XIV, influenced by his awe of Cromwell, took care that the edicts in favor of the Huguenots were, were observed with exactness. Never were laws more strictly enforced in France than the laws protecting the religious freedom of the French Calvinists because of the diplomacy of Oliver Cromwell. By the way, this, this cardinal who was the chief advisor of the Louis XIV was said to have been more afraid of Cromwell than he was of the devil. Well, Cromwell's attachment to the Reformed faith and to the cause of the Reformed faith expended all over Europe. Not only to come to the rescue of the Waldensians by diplomacy, come to the rescue of the French by diplomacy. He didn't send his armies anywhere. But in Switzerland, he endeavored to arouse and, and uh, refresh and revive the in interest of the Protestant Reformation, which interest had grown cold. He interposed into Germany in defense of the religious freedoms of reformed states in Germany. He was responsible for taking up collections in behalf of persecuted Calvinists in Bohemia, Poland, Silesia. In fact, at one point, Cromwell conceived of the idea of one great global institution that would look after the spread of the Reformed faith. He proposed to unite all the various members of Protestantism into one body to make them as strong as possible in their resistance against Rome and in their spread of the Reformed faith. So to this end, he founded a council called the Council for the General Interests of Protestantism. He divided the whole Protestant world outside of England, the entire Protestant world, into four provinces. And the council was to consist of seven members and four secretaries who were responsible to keep, carry on uh, correspondence with all the Reformed churches of the world and to constantly stay on top of things to make sure that the Reformed religion was prospering and was pure throughout the world. He even gathered 10,000 pounds a year placed at the disposal of this council to advance the Reformed faith. Well, this is some of the things that the Lord Protector Cromwell was involved in internationally. And as Daubigny said, in every place Cromwell showed himself the true Samaritan, binding up the wounds of those who had fallen into the hands of the wicked and pouring in oil and wine. He was the greatest Protestant that has lived since the days of Calvin and Luther. More than any other sovereign of England, he deserved the glorious title of defender of the faith. Rarely has there appeared in the world a heart that beat so strongly for everlasting truth. How do you assess this man? Let me give you the assessment of this man by one of his great leveler opponents, John Lilburn, whom he had to throw in jail. John Lilburn said, and I quote, he was the most absolute, single-hearted, great man in England, untainted and unbiased by ends of his own. That was his enemy talk. 1656, he wrote a letter to his son Henry, and this summarizes the life of Cromwell. Son, study to be innocent. Cry to the Lord 
to give you a plain, single heart. Some of the things that speak the most about this man is, are the days around his death. He lingered a good while. He would come in and out of consciousness. He would say things when he was out of his head. Uh, sometimes the sentences were disjointed. But I want to read to you some of the disjointed sentences that reveal a man's heart. When all of the fronts are taken away and all the attempts to impress people are taken away and all you have is the heart of a man unshielded by his personality now because he's in a fever and his mind's not always there and he's talking. This tells you something about this great man. He addressed his wife on one occasion, stood re re uh, weeping around his children, weeping around his bed. He sa said to them, love not this world. I say unto you, it's not good that you should love this world. I leave you the covenant to feed upon. On another occasion, he shouted out from his, his bed, Lord, thou knowest if I desire to live, it is to show forth thy praise and declare thy works. Another time, one of his nurses heard him mo moaning, is there none that says, who will deliver me from the peril? Man can do nothing. God can do what he will. On another occasion, he was heard to say, all the promises of God are in Christ. To the glory of God by us, by us in Jesus Christ, the Lord has filled me with as much assurance of his pardon and his love as my soul can hold. I think I'm the poorest wretch that lives but I love God, or rather, am beloved of God. I am a conqueror, and more than a conqueror, through Christ that strengthens me. Such were Cromwell's engrossing reflections in these solemn moments when the soul, no longer master of itself, shows what it really is. All his thoughts were for the Savior and for the covenant and for heaven. And as you might expect, God would have him go out in a flash and blaze of glory one of the worst hurricanes ever to hit London. Hit London during the last hours and days of Cromwell's life. And as one man said, the death of Cromwell shook London more than the recent hurricane. Here's a prayer that he prayed. One of his last prayer. Somebody wrote it down. They heard him and they wrote down every word. Lord, though I am a miserable and wretched creature, I am in covenant with thee through grace. And I may, I will come to thee for thy people. Thou hast made me, though very unworthy, a mean instrument to do them some good and thee service. And many of them have set too high a value upon me, though others wish and would be glad of my death. Lord, however thou dispose of me, continue and go on to do good for them. Pardon thy foolish people. Forgive their sins and do not forsake them, but love and bless them. Give them consistency of judgment, one heart, and mutual love. And go on to deliver them and with the work of reformation and make the name of Christ glorious in the world. Teach those who look too much on thy instruments to depend more upon thyself. Pardon such as desire to trample upon the dust of a poor worm, for they are thy people too. And pardon the folly of this short prayer, and give me rest for Jesus Christ's sake, to whom with thee and thy Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. In such words, Cromwell pardoned his enemies and prayed for the misguided Republicans. In fact, he prayed even for Charles Stewart and his wretched satellites who afterwards trampled upon the illustrious ashes of the protector, dug up his grave, and beheaded him. On the Thursday following, Maidstone, who was in attendance on His Highness Cromwell, heard him saying with an oppressed voice, difficult to speak, Truly God is good, indeed He is. He will not, here his voice failed him, what he would have added was undoubtedly, He will not leave me. He will not leave me. 
He spoke again from time to time in the midst of all his sufferings with much cheerfulness and fervor of spirit. I would be willing to live, he said, to be farther serviceable to God and his people, but my work is done. Yet God will be with his people. Ere long he betrayed by his movements that agitation, that agitation which often precedes death. And when something was offered him to drink, with the remark that it would make him sleep, he answered, It is not my design to drink or sleep, but my design is to make what haste I can to be gone. September the 3rd, 1658, the anniversary of his famous battles against the Scots at Dunbar and Charles II at Worcester. At three o'clock in the afternoon, he died. Thus ends the story of, Rock, of Oliver Cromwell. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the testimony, the life, the encouragement of this man who believed that Christ, not man, is king. May we learn from and imitate his strengths. May we avoid his mistakes, but give us a heart that beat like his. For Christ's sake, amen. <laughs>